chapter four of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four more of camp desquatu part two the dogs of the drift the very home of visions and strange traditions and mysteries is newfoundland that great half-explored island in the wild north atlantic here the iron coast harbourless for league upon league opposes a black perpendicular front to the vast green seas which slowly and unceasingly beneath their veil of fogs roll in and fall in thunder amidst its pinnacles and caverns at wide intervals the cliffs give way a little forming narrow coves and havens so limited that scarce a score of fishing boats can find safe harbourage therein in almost every such cove may be found a tiny settlement remote from the world utterly shut in upon itself save during the brief months of summer with no ideas but what spring from its people's daily toil and from the stupendous aspects surrounding nature is it strange that to such simple and lonely souls the wild elements become instinct with strange life and seem to dominate their thoughts and their existence for them the driving mists are filled with apparitions the gnarled and wind-beaten firs take on strange features in the dusk through the ravings of the gale against those towering cliffs comes to their ears a hubbub of articulate voices mingled with the cries of the baffled sea-birds men dwelling under such influences are imaginative if left in ignorance they grow of necessity superstitious the mouths of these islanders overflow with unearthly tales nearly all of which may be traced to the workings of some natural force but their faith in these fancies is as unquestioning as our acceptance of the word that the world is round what were variously known to the islanders as the dogs of the drift the white dogs and the grey dogs i heard of all over the island as went the tale generally and ever with bated breath these beings were a team of gigantic dogs lean and pale in colour driven furiously by a gaunt woman in flowing garments of white they were said to appear to travellers caught journeying in a storm and to dash past with shrill howls when the storm was at its highest never closer did they come than within a stone's throw but their coming meant death ere sunset to one or another of those met by the apparition in the winter of eighteen eighty eight a fire took place in the out harbour where i was then living and a large part of the winter's stores were destroyed to our secluded settlement this was an overwhelming calamity and there was nothing for it if we should escape actual starvation but to send some one for supplies to harbour britain the journey was one of great difficulty and hardship some hundred and odd miles to be traversed through an unbroken wilderness and the only means of conveyance a dog-team and a sledge being young and venturesome and ever on the search for a new experience i volunteered for the service taking with me my man mike conley a keen hunter and one well skilled in driving dogs our team was a powerful one led by a great black and white fellow whom the other dogs devotedly obeyed with provision for ourselves and team with blankets and the other necessaries of such a trip our long sledge was well loaded down and we took with us money to buy supplies as well as pay the transportation of them back to the famishing settlement we marched on snowshoes for the most part save over those open stretches of plain where the crust had hardened like ice and where the dogs were able at a brisk gallop to draw both ourselves and their load at such times exhilarated by the swift motion in that keen air and sparkling sunshine the hardships of our journey were forgotten and we thrilled under the beauty of the glittering world of white but far otherwise was it when our course lay as it generally did through juniper swamps and tangled accumulation of forest growths then a whole day's severest toil advanced us but a few miles on our way the dogs floundering in the drifts and gullies would get their traces into an almost hopeless snarl and many a beating the poor brutes brought upon themselves by the dangerous temper they displayed under such annoyances they were a fierce and wolfish pack and a strong hand we were compelled to keep over them 
our nights when it was fine and calm were pleasant enough as we lay wrapped in many blankets around our fire our custom was to dig a deep hollow in the snow and floor it with soft boughs leaving a space at one side for the fire such a camp nestled in a thick grove of var or spruce was snug in all ordinary weather but sometimes the rage of the gale would make a fire impossible the wind gusts would fairly shatter it to bits and bursting in upon us from every quarter drive the brands and coals all over the camp there was then nothing left for us but to smother the remnants with snow and huddled all together in a heap men dogs and blankets to await wretchedly the coming of the stormy dawn always on such occasions would mike who was superstitious to the finger-tips be looking out in fascinated expectation for the dreadful gray dogs at each yelling blast he strained his eyes through the dark till from laughing at him i grew angry and he was constrained to hide his fears i represented to him that as long as he kept his eyes beneath his blanket these dogs of the drift need have no terrors for him even though they come the whole night long and career about the camp for the portent only applied to those beholding it this view of the case however was but little relief to him as his fears were no less on my account than on his own notwithstanding one or two such grim experiences all went well with us till our journey was two-thirds done and the hardest of the way lay behind us then as we floundered one afternoon through a deadwood swamp mike slipped between two fallen trunks and broke his left arm near the shoulder this was a most unlooked-for blow but the poor fellow bore it like a hero with rude splints i set the arm and bandaged it and after a day's halt i fixed him a sort of bed on the sledge so that we were enabled to continue our journey but now we were forced to make long detours in order to avoid rough country on the following morning to our satisfaction we came out upon a chain of lakes which promised us something like fair going for a while in a sheltered place on the shore we found a rude cabin occupied by two hunters who had their traps set in the surrounding woods neither the faces nor the manner of these men did i find prepossessing but they received us hospitably fed us well and pressed us to stay with them overnight not unnaturally they were curious as to the motives of our strange journey and before i could give him a hint of warning my garrulous and fearless mike had put him in possession of the whole story the greedy look of intelligence which passed furtively between them upon learning we were on the way to purchase stores aroused all my suspicions and set me sharply on my guard their hospitality now became doubly pressing in fact when they saw me bent on immediate departure they grew almost threatening in their earnestness at this assuming an angry air i asked them why they should so concern themselves about what was entirely my own business and i gave them plainly to understand that i wanted no interference changing their tone at once and deprecating my warmth they called to my notice the storm that was gathering overhead they were right the signs could hardly be mistaken the little bursts and eddies of drift that rose fitfully from the lake's white surface the long whispering sob of gusts that woke at intervals behind the forest the heavy but vague massing of clouds all over the sky which at a little distance was confused with the earth by a sort of pearly haze all pretended a hurricane of snow before many hours with reason on their side and the evident desire of my wounded mike as well our host urged delay till the storm should have spent its fury but silencing mike with a glance i rejected politely but decidedly their proffered shelter and made ready the team for a start as soon as i had begun to tackle the dogs the younger of our host suddenly took up his gun and left the cabin saying he thought he'd better visit a few traps before the storm set in he turned i noticed down the shore of the lake parallel to the direction in which our own course lay the older man speeded our departure with all seeming good will announcing that he only waited to see us safely off and would then follow his partner to examine the traps once under way i retailed my suspicions to mike who heedless as he was had been putting this and that together during the last few minutes bitterly he bewailed his helplessness 
and many and varied were the maledictions which from his couch in the blankets he hurled upon our prospective foes at his suggestion we shunned the wooded shore taking our course as nearly as possible down the middle of the lake with my rifle in one hand and my long lashed whip in the other i urged the team to such a pace as it strained my running powers to keep up with the snow was soft and for the dogs as for myself the work was too severe to last but my aim was if possible to settle with the first ruffian who had it seemed likely undertaken to head us off before the second could overtake and join forces with him but suddenly with a whistle and a biting blast the storm was upon us for a moment the dogs cowered down in their tracks and then we were fain to hug the shore for shelter the shelter was not much for the storm seemed to rage from all quarters yet breathless and blinded though we were we were able to make some headway at a momentary lull between the gusts we rounded a sharp headland and entered a long narrow passage between the shore and a wooded island a likely place enough for the murderin thief exclaimed mike but we plunged ahead the words had scarcely left his mouth when the snow seemed to rise thinly about us in a thousand spirals and whirls a tremendous wind drove down the channel and smote us in the face with a long confused yelping howl which made my flesh creep with its resemblance to a cry of dogs our team trembled terribly and lay down the gray dogs came in a hoarse cry from mike's lips and at the same moment there swept past us in the heart of the whirlwind a pack of wild huddling and leaping drifts followed by a tall bent woman-like figure of snow cloud which seemed to stoop over and urge on their furious flight the vision vanished the shrill clamour died away over the open reaches of the lake and shaking off my tremor i cheered our dogs again to the road but as for mike he was overwhelmed with horror he would admit no doubt but that one of us must die before nightfall and for my own part i felt that our circumstances lent only too ugly a colour to his fancy a succession of fitful though not violent gusts confronted us through our whole course up this defile the air was white with fine snow and we made but meagre headway it must have been about half a mile that we had covered since seeing the apparition when we were startled by a sharp report just ahead of us and instantly our dogs stopped short and fell into wild confusion springing to their heads i found the great black and white leader in his death struggle bleeding upon the snow cut the traces cried mike and though not comprehending his purpose i stooped to do so it was well for me i obeyed as i stooped a shot snapped behind us and the shrill whimper of a bullet sang past my ear at the same moment the gust subsiding i saw our first assailant step boldly out of cover just ahead of us and raise his gun to shoulder for a second shot but i had severed the traces there was a sort of fierce hiss from mike's tongue and with a yell the whole team sprang forward to avenge their leader the ruffian realizing at once his peril discharged his gun wildly threw it down and fled for his life but he was too late in briefer space i think than it takes to tell it the pack was upon him he was literally torn to pieces with whip and gunstock i threw myself upon the mad brutes who presently as if satisfied with their dreadful revenge followed me back in submission to their places as for the second scoundrel he had taken swift warning and vanished the dogs themselves seemed cowed by what they had done and for my own part i was filled with horror but no such weak sentimentality found the slightest favour with mike rebuking me for having beaten them he lavished praise and endearments upon the dogs he reminded me moreover that they had saved the lives of both of us or had at the very least saved myself from the necessity of taking blood upon my hands realising this i made hasty amends to the poor shivering brutes comforting them with a liberal feast of dried dogfish my present feeling toward them as i look back upon the episode is one of unmitigated gratitude the rest of our journey was accomplished without more than ordinary trouble 
a good deal of my spare energy i wasted in the effort to overturn mike's faith which stands still unshaken in the supernatural character of the dogs of the drift with such terrible testimony in his favour i could hardly have expected much success for my arguments for as he concluded triumphantly if the spectral team came down that channel as it plainly did then the scoundrel lying in wait for us must have seen it as well as we and did not he meet his doom before nightfall if that's what you call a merry tale said ranolf then the one i'm going to tell you of newfoundland will make your eyes drop weeping tears it concerns the fate of ben christie's bull caribou ben christie was the first mate of the little coasting steamer garnet of the newfoundland coastal service born in one of those narrow out harbors that wedge themselves in somewhere between the cliffs and the gray sea his eyes had been bent seaward from the beginning inland all was mystery to him alluring mystery he had never been out of sight of the sea except when the fog was too thick for him to distinguish it as he leaned over the vessel's rail he had grown up with a codline in his hands in his eyes the alternation of fog and flashing sunlight in his ears the scream of the sea-fowl and the shattering thunder of the surf upon the cliffs of his native island he knew little but the seaward faces of her rocky ramparts over which he had often climbed to gather the eggs of puffin and gannet of towns he knew but the wharves and waterfronts of st john's and halifax and harbour grace but he was at home in his dory as it climbed the sullen purple-green slopes of the great waves on the banks and he knew how to follow the seal and triumph over the perils of the floating fields one day in halifax in a little inn on water street ben christie saw the stuffed and mounted head of a well-antlered bull caribou it fired his fancy and from that day forth to shoot a bull caribou became his consuming ambition when he had been serving as mate of the garnet for about two years the boiler of that redoubtable craft refused to perform its functions and she was laid up in st john's harbour for repairs christie's opportunity had come he furbished up his old muzzle-loading sealing gun long of barrel and huge of bore and took passage on a little coasting schooner bound for the west shore and the mouth of the codroy river arriving at the codroy he remained in the settlement for a few days looking for a suitable comrade to go with him into the interior when his errand became known which was right speedily seeing that he could talk of nothing but bull caribou he found plenty of practised hunters ready to accompany him on his quest but none of these were quite to his liking they all knew too much they seemed to him to be impressed with the idea that he did not know anything about caribou hunting and they talked about getting him the finest pair of horns on the barrens now just what ben wanted was to get those horns himself he wanted to do the shooting himself and the hunting himself and he did not want any one around to patronize him and deride his mistakes ben was off on a holiday and he felt himself entitled to make mistakes if he wanted to at length he met a harum-scarum little irishman named mike slohan who said he doted on hunting but couldn't hit anything smaller than a barn door and wouldn't know to use his own phrase a spruce caribou from a bull partridge ben took him to his heart at once and without delay the pair made ready for their expedition inextinguishable was the mirth of all the experienced hunters and grievous were the mishaps they prophesied for our amateur nimrods till at last ben's keen blue eyes began to flash dangerously and they judged it prudent to check their jibes whatever mike slohan's inefficiency as a hunter he was as fearless as a grizzly and he understood to its minutest detail the art of camping out with comfort he armed himself only with a little muzzle-loading shotgun but in other respects the two went well equipped when mike declared that all was ready he and ben embarked in a canoe they had hired in the settlement and started gaily up the river after ascending the main stream some fifty or sixty miles they turned into a small tributary which flows into the codroy from the northward this stream ran between precipitous banks often more than a hundred feet in height its deep and gloomy ravine was chiselled through a vast tableland without landmark or limit scourged by every wind that blows 
this inexpressibly bleak region mike declared to be the barrens where they would find the caribou into its depths they penetrated till their way was barred by fierce rapids at the foot of which they made their camp in a warm and windless cove it was well on in the autumn a season when the bull caribou are very pugnacious whence it came that ben christie had not long to wait before finding himself face to face with the object of his desire the first day's hunting however was fruitless leaving the camp after a by no means early or hasty breakfast ben and mike climbed the great wall of the ravine and no sooner were they fairly out upon the level waste than they descried three caribou feeding about half a mile away this to ben seemed quite a matter of course nevertheless he was exhilarated at the sight and set out in hot pursuit followed by the laughing mike they made no secret of their approach but advanced in plain view as if they were driving cattle in a pasture and the caribou being in a pleasant humour and willing to avoid disturbance discreetly withdrew after pursuing them for three or four miles ben gave up the chase much disappointed to find the animals so wild when the hunters started to return to the river they were astonished to find no sign of a river or the course of one anywhere in the landscape mike at once concluded that they were lost but ben was not troubled he had the sun to steer by and was amply satisfied indeed he felt much at home on the barrens where as he said there was plenty of sea-room and a chap could breathe free he shaped his course confidently for the camp and fetched the river as unerringly as if it had been a port on the south shore the barrens which cover so large a portion of the interior of newfoundland vary somewhat in character in different parts of the island where ben and mike were investigating them they were covered with wide patches of a sturdy stunted shrub called locally scronic this scronic played a most important part in the experiences which presently befell the hunters it grows about shoulder high at its highest and spreads out like a miniature banyan tree its twisted stems are bare to a height of about two to three feet and its top so densely matted as almost to shut out the light the shrub is an evergreen a remote cousin to the juniper and its stems are wide enough apart for one to freely crawl about between them when one is caught in a storm on the barrens the scronic patches make no mean shelter scattered thinly amid the scronic stood bald white granite boulders from two or three to ten or twelve feet high and here and there lay deep pools cup-shaped hollows filled to the brim with transparent icy water ah said mike as they climbed down the ravine to the camp but it's a queer country to ben however all dry land was queer so he hardly comprehended mike's remark on the following day before they set out for the hunt a council of war was held said ben you see the critters won't let us git nigh enough to fire them afore they clear out and then where are we sure and we'll hide in the scronic replied mike and shoot em as they go by and maybe they won't go by just to oblige us suggested ben i reckon we'd have to get down so they can't see us and crawl up on em these tactics decided upon the hunters mounted to the plain enthusiastic and sanguine eagerly they scanned the bleak reaches not a caribou was there in sight ben's face fell and he heaved a mighty sigh of disappointment but mike was not so easily cast down come on said he cheerily and we'll find the baits before you know where they are with their guns over their shoulders they picked their way through the scronic for a couple of hundred yards till suddenly out from behind a boulder not twenty paces in front of them stepped a huge bull caribou the caribou was solitary and in a very bad humour he shook his spreading antlers and snorted ominously you shoot is yourn shouted mike in wild excitement brandishing his gun at full cock over his head proudly ben raised his long weapon to his shoulder and pulled the trigger there was no marked result however as he had forgotten to cock the gun just as he hastily remedied this oversight the caribou charged madly ben fired and missed he'll kill you dodge him in the scronic yelled mike and obediently ben dived into the nearest patch acting upon a natural instinct he scurried from side to side to throw his pursuer off the track 
the caribou sprang furiously upon the bushes where ben had disappeared and trampled them with his knife-like front hoofs then he turned on mike who had been anxiously waiting for him to keep still and give him a fair shot in desperation mike fired just grazing the animal's flank and then he darted like a rabbit under the skronix bushes when those deadly forehoofs came down on the place where he had vanished the little irishman was not there nimbly and noiselessly he put all the distance he could between himself and the spot where he heard his enemy tearing away at the skronnick finding himself unpursued ben made haste to reload his gun at the sound of mike's shot he thrust his head out of his hiding-place in time to see his comrade go under cover very deliberately ben rammed the bullet home and put on the cap then standing up to his full height and taking aim at the caribou's hind quarters which were towards him he shouted load up mike and fired again unfortunately for the accuracy of ben's aim the caribou had wheeled sharp round at the sound of his voice and charged without an instant's delay so again the shot went wild and again with alacrity that did credit to his bulk ben scuttled under the skronnick but this time the indignant bull furious at being thus outwitted bounded into the bush and began thrusting about at random with horns and hoofs more than once ben narrowly escaped those terrible weapons and his trepidation began to be mingled with fierce wrath at the idea of being hustled round this way by a critter he could get no chance to load up again and he was on the point of stepping forth and attacking the animal with the butt of his gun he felt as if he was battened under hatches in a sinking ship before he could put his purpose into effect however there was another shot from mike it evidently struck the animal somewhere for he bellowed with rage as he bounded over the thickets to join battle with his other assailant the irishman had not waited to mark the result of his shot but had plunged instantly out of sight and betaken himself to a position well removed the angry bull had no idea of his whereabouts but thrashed about wildly while the little irishman chuckled in his sleeve as soon as ben once more got his gun loaded he stuck his head up through the skronnick he observed that in his wanderings beneath the scrub he had worked his way very nearly to the big granite boulder before mentioned he did not fire for he was resolved not to waste his shot this time just as he made up his mind to try a rush for the boulder from the top of which he would be master of the situation the caribou looked up and caught sight of him again the animal's charge was so lightning-like in its rapidity that ben could do nothing but dive once more beneath the kindly skronnick as fast as he could he worked his way toward the boulder but in his haste the movement of the bushes betrayed him one of the razor-edged hoofs came down within a foot or two of his face and he shrank back swiftly making himself very small his changed course brought him to the very brink of one of the deep pools already spoken of and he almost fell into it in turning aside from that obstacle the shaking of the bushes again gave the bull a hint of his position with a cough and a bellow the animal leaped to the spot just missed ben's retiring feet and plunged headlong into the pool this seemed to ben just his opportunity for gaining the rock he sprang up and made a dash for it but before he reached its foot and a glance told him that it was not to be scaled on that side the caribou had picked himself nimbly out of the water and was after him his fury by no means dampened by the ducking grinding his teeth ben darted yet again beneath the scrub but this time it was the closest shave he had had the skronnick was thinner here and he would hardly have succeeded in evading his antagonist for more than a minute had not mike come to the rescue the irishman rose up with a wild yell discharged his gun right in the caribou's face missed with his customary facility and dropped again into the skronnick the foaming animal dashed away to hunt him and ben creeping stealthily around the boulder found its accessible side and scrambled to the summit as the caribou came bounding to its base if the boulder had been a very few feet lower the adventure might have had a very different issue 
but as it was the height proved sufficient ben surveyed those spear-sharp prongs from his point of vantage just three feet beyond reach of their vicious thrusts and thought proudly how fine they would look mounted in the cabin of the garnet he was in no great hurry to end the performance and he did not like to fire while the caribou was so close to the muzzle of the gun but presently the animal paused and looked around for mike he turned in fact as if to go and hunt the little irishman again and ben's heart smote him for having even for a moment forgotten the peril in which his comrade yet remained he took careful aim at a point close behind the caribou's shoulder at the report the animal sprang straight into the air and fell back stone dead very triumphant quite pardonably so in fact were ben and mike as they returned to the codroy settlement with their spoils they discreetly refrained from detailing at codroy all the particulars of the hunt but if the tourist exploring the coast of newfoundland in the steamer garnet chances to remark upon the immense pair of caribou antlers which hang over the cabin door he will hear the whole story from ben christie who is endowed with an excellent sense of humour when ranolf ended he received unusual applause then i stepped so to speak into the breach i cannot hope said i to win the ears of this worshipful company with such gentle humour as ranolf has just achieved but i have a good rousing adventure to tell you with lots of blood though little thunder the scene of it is not far from newfoundland let this fact speak in its favour fire away old man said queerman i take for my narrative the simple title of labrador wolves said i in early june two years ago my friend jack rawlings of the canada geological survey was occupied in exploring parts of the labrador coast from the mouth of the moisic river eastward the following adventure one of several that befell him in that wild region has a peculiar interest from its possible connection with a throng of terrible legends the scenes of which are laid along those shores ever since the gulf of st lawrence became known to the fishing fleets of brittany and the basque provinces its northeastern coast has been peopled by the vivid imaginations of the fishermen and sailors with supernatural beings of various fashions all agreeing however in the attributes of malignity and noisiness demons and griffins and monsters indescribable were supposed to haunt the bleak hills and dreadful ravines ships driven reluctantly inshore by stress of weather were wont to carry away strange tales of howlings and visions to freeze the marrow of the folk at home the probable origin of those myths may be found in the fact that from time to time the coast has been ravaged by hordes of gigantic grey wolves sweeping down from the unfathomed wilderness of the high interior plateau one of these visitations was in eighteen seventy three when many of the coast dwellers whose scanty settlements cling here and there in the lonely harbours were torn to pieces on the shore or shut up in their cabins till starvation stared them in the face no great stretch of fancy is required to metamorphose a pack of ravening wolves into a yelling concourse of demons what befell jack rawlings i will tell in his own words our schooner said jack lay at anchor in a little landlocked bay where never a wind could get at her and much of our exploration was done by means of short boat trips in one direction or the other one morning frank jones and i made up our minds to take a day off and try and kill a salmon or two about five miles west of where we lay there was a cove where behind a low rocky point a little river came down out of the mountains half a mile above the head of tide the stream fell noisily over a shallow fall into a most enticing pool and we calculated that we would be just in good time for the first run of the salmon there was a stretch of shoals off the mouth of the stream and no sheltered anchorage near so we took the small boat for the trip and a fresh breeze off the gulf blew us to our destination speedily it was high tide when we arrived and we hauled up the boat in the cove under shelter of the point besides our rods we had enough grub for a good lunch and our topcoats in case it should blow up cold in the afternoon 
frank had brought his gun along with a few cartridges loaded with number one and number two shot in case he might want to shoot some big bird for his collection which is already one of the best private collections in ottawa when we had put our rods together we moved up along the wet edges of the beach which glistened in the morning sun and presently found ourselves at the basin where we expected our sport over the low foaming barrier of the falls we saw a salmon make way in a flashing leap and we knew we had struck both the right place and the right time i need not tell you the particulars of the sport you know what a labrador salmon stream is when you happen to take it in a good humour enough to say when we began to think of lunch it was about two o'clock and we had six fish ranging from ten to thirty-five pounds lying in splendid array beneath a neighbouring rock as much of our spoils as we could carry at once we took down to the spot where the boat lay and building a little fire of driftwood we proceeded to fry some salmon collops for lunch while enjoying our after-dinner smoke we observed that the wind had shifted a point or two to the east and was blowing up half a gale great scott exclaimed frank if we don't get under way from here right off we're going to be storm stayed this wind will raise a sea presently that we won't be able to face let's leave right off i'll drag the boat down to the water while you go after the rest of those fish no no said i we'll just stay where we are for the present don't you see that the waves are already breaking into the cove too heavy for us if you were around on the other side of the point now you'd see what the water is and you'd be glad enough you're out of it i can tell you we're all right here and we may as well fish till toward sundown and if the wind has not eased off by that time we'll just have to snug the boat up here and foot it over the hills to the schooner it's not more than five or six miles away frank strolled across the point for a look at the sea and came back in agreement with my views then we returned to the pool and whipped it assiduously till after five o'clock but without a repetition of the morning's success meanwhile the wind got fiercer and fiercer so we went back to the boat and made a hearty supper as preparation for the rough tramp that lay before us we took our time and smoked at leisure and cashed our prizes and resolved not to start till moonrise by this time the tide was well out and the cove had become an expanse of shingly flats threaded by the shallow current of the stream and fringed along its seaward edge with a line of angry surf by and by the moon got up out of the gulf round and white and bringing with her an extra blow as the shore brightened up clearly we set out moving along the crest of the point frank was just saying how spectral those scarred grey hills look in this light how suitable a place for the hobgoblins those old frenchmen imagined to possess them when as if to point his remarks there came a ghostly clamour high and quavering from a dark cleft far up the mountainside we both started and i exclaimed the loons have overheard you old fellow and are trying to work on your nerves they want revenge for the stuffed companions of their bygone days that's not loons said frank very seriously it's no more like loons than it's like lions listen to that i listened and was convinced then it must be those old frenchmen's friends i suggested and i feel greatly inclined to avoid meeting them if possible it's the wolves from the interior rejoined frank i'd rather have the griffins and goblins don't you remember seventy eight i'm afraid we're in a box let us get down to windward of the point and lie low among the rocks i suggested as likely as not the brutes won't detect us and will keep along up the shore instantly we dropped into concealment keeping through the apertures of the crest a fearful eye upon the mountain slopes we were fools to be sure for we might have known those keen eyes had spotted us from the first silhouetted as we had been against the moonlit sea presently frank suggested the boat but my sufficient answer was to point to the raging surf so we lay still and prayed to be ignored in a few minutes our suspense was painfully relieved by the appearance of a pack of grey forms which swept out into the moonlight beyond the river and came heading straight for our refuge two dozen of em gasped frank and they certainly spotted us i whispered there's not a tree nor a hole we can get into muttered frank we can get on top of this rock and fight for it i groaned in desperation 
i have it exclaimed frank the boat we'll get under it and hold it down leaping to our feet we broke wildly for the boat the wolves greeted us with an exultant howl as they dashed through the shallow river we had just time to do it comfortably the boat was heavy and we turned it over in such a way that the bow was steadied between two rocks once safely underneath we lifted the craft a little and jammed her between the rocks so that the brutes would be unable to root her over one side was raised about eight or ten inches by a piece of rock which frank was going to remove but i stopped him by this time the brutes were on top of the boat and we could hear by the snarling that they had unearthed our salmon just then a row of long snouts and snapping jaws came under the gunwale and we shrank as small as possible the brutes shoved and struggled so mightily that it seemed as if they must succeed in overturning the boat and a cold sweat broke out on my forehead shoot i yelled frantically and at the same instant my ears were almost burst by the discharge of both frank's barrels a terrific yelping and howling ensued while our crowded quarters were filled to suffocation with the smoke when the air cleared somewhat we could see that the wolves were eating the two whose heads frank's shot had shattered our position was very cramped and uncomfortable half sitting half lying between the thorts but by stretching flat we could peer beneath the gunwale and command a view of the situation we had a moment's respite frank said i we might as well be eaten as scared to death don't fire that gun again in here it nearly blew my eardrums in club the brutes over the snout all that's necessary is to disable them and it seems their kind companions will do the rest all right responded frank only you must do your share and he passed me up the hatchet out of the cuddy hole in the bow by this time the slaughtered wolves were reduced to hair and bones and the pack once more turned their attention to us once more the ominous row of heads appeared squeezed under the boat side and claws tore madly at the roof that sheltered us as combatants our positions were exceedingly constrained but so too were those of our assailants a wolf cannot dodge well when his head is squeezed under a gunwale hampered as i was i smashed the skulls of the two within easiest reach barking my knuckles villainously as i wielded my weapon i heard frank too pounding viciously up in the bow then the attack drew off again and the feasting and quarrelling recommenced i turned to make some remark to my companion but gave a yell of dismay instead as i felt a pair of iron jaws grab me by the foot and tear away the sole of my boot in the excitement of the contest my foot had gone too near the gunwale the wolves were now growing too wary to thrust their heads under the gunwale for a time they merely sniffed along the edge and though we might easily have smashed their toes or the ends of their noses we refrained in order to gain opportunity for something more effective we must have waited thus for as much as ten minutes and the inaction was becoming intolerable when the brutes thinking perhaps we were dead or gone to sleep made a sudden concerted effort to reach us there must have been a dozen heads at once thrust in beneath the gunwale one preternaturally lean wolf even wriggled his shoulders fairly through so that he was within an ace of taking a mouthful out of my leg before i could have a fair blow at him with my hatchet i think we either killed or disabled four at least in that assault thereupon the pack drew off a little and sat down on their haunches to consider they could not possibly have been still hungry having eaten two or three wolves and a hundred pounds or so of nice fresh salmon and we were in hopes they would go away but instead of that they came back to the boat and set up a tremendous howling which may have been a call for reinforcements or a challenge to come out and settle the trouble in a square fight i asked frank how many cartridges he had left oh he said a dozen or more at least verily well said i you'd better blaze away and kill as many as you can i'll protect my eardrums by stuffing my ears full of rags try and make every shot tell as the wolves were not more than eight or ten feet away the heavy bird shot had the same effect as a bullet two of the brutes were clean bowled over then the others sprang furiously about the boat when frank thrust forth the muzzle of the gun it was seized and all but wrenched from his grasp 
he bagged two more then the rest moved round to the other side of the boat but very soon the survivors appeared to make up their minds to a new departure and after a little running hither and thither with their noses down they suddenly crystallized as it were into a well-ordered pack and swept away up the shore their strange terrible wind-like ululations were soon re-echoing in the mountains we came forth from our uncomfortable but effectual retreat and counted our victims when the last sound of the howling had long died away we set forth in the direction of the schooner which was not the direction in which the wolves were journeying End of chapter 4 part 2chapter five of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five squatook river and horton branch the next was a rainy day at camp de squatook of course we fished off and on all day whenever the rain held up a little and in a deep run about a hundred yards below the white fish fence sam had the luck to land the big trout of the trip it weighed fresh from the water three pounds three ounces and it was killed with a minnow sam complained however that it had given him no more play than one of his two pounders of the day before we thought him very artful in thus concealing his elation so as to ward off our envy by nightfall it was raining pitchforks in our tight tent with wax candles beaming and the rattle of the rain on the roof we felt very snug but inexpressibly lonely was the washing sound in the pine branches and all the rest of the world seemed ages away from us for a while no stories were called for instead of that we played mississippi euchre when we grew tired of the game stranion exclaimed let's have one story and then turn in who will hold forth i asked well said ranolf since you are all so pressing i will try and rise to the occasion it seems to be an understood thing that all these stories are animal stories but in this one i must wander from the rule and tell you a story of rain and wind the noise in the tent roof to-night reminds me of a nice scrape which i got myself into only last summer when you hear the story you will understand just why i tell it to-night sam you heard all about it two days after it happened it's appropriate to the occasion isn't it i mean about how i was wrecked in a boom house highly appropriate indeed said sam well here you have it continued ranolf you'll excuse me of course if i indulge at first in a little technical description to make the incidents clear the crocks point sheer boom started from the shore a few yards below the point it slanted out and down till it met a great pier in mid-river to which it was secured by heavy chains from the pier it swung free down the middle of the channel for a distance of several hundred yards swaying toward one shore or the other according to the set of the wings and the strength of the current it was a sturdy structure of squared and bolted timbers about three feet in width and rising some three or four inches above the water the boom of course was jointed at the pier so as to swing as on a hinge and at a distance of perhaps seventy yards below the pier it had a second open joint at the head of this section stood a windlass wound with a light wire cable at intervals of ten or twelve feet along the right-hand side of this section for about one hundred and fifty feet in all were hinged stout wings of two-inch plank ten feet long and eighteen inches wide set edgeways in the water so as to catch the current like a rudder or a centerboard through iron staples in the outer ends of these wings ran and was fastened the cable from the windlass when the cable was unwound the wings lay flat against the side of the boom but a few turns of the windlass sufficed to draw the wings out at an angle to the boom whereupon the force of the current sweeping strongly against their faces would slowly sway the whole free length of the boom toward the opposite shore the section of the sheer boom thus peculiarly adorned was called the wing boom just above the upper end of the wing boom at a place widened out a few feet to receive it was built a little shanty known as the boom house to the spectator from the shore the boom house seemed to be afloat in the wide lonely level of the river the office of the sheer boom was to guide the run of the logs as they came floating briskly down from the lumber regions of the upper river 
as long as the wings were not in use and the boom swung with the current the logs were allowed to continue their journey down the middle of the channel but when the wings were set and the boom stood over toward the far shore then the stream of logs was diverted into the mouth of the stationary boom whose chain of piers held them imprisoned till they were wanted at the mill below the island in the boom house dwelt an old lumberman named matt barnes who though his feet and ankles were crippled with rheumatism from exposure to the icy water in the spring stream drivings was nevertheless still clever in the handling of boat or canoe and very competent to manage the windlass and the wing boom on the southward slope of the line of uplands which thrusting out boldly into the river formed crock's point stood a comfortable old farmhouse in whose seclusion i was spending the months of august and september about four o'clock in the afternoon it was my daily habit to stroll down to the shore and hail matt barnes who would presently paddle over in his skiff and take me out to the boom for my afternoon swim the boom was a most convenient and delightful place to go in off of as the boys say one rough afternoon when the boom was all awash and the wind sweeping up the river so keen with suggestions of autumn that i was glad to do my undressing and my dressing in the boom house just as i was about to take my plunge matt asked if i would mind staying and watching the boom for him while he paddled up to the corners to buy himself some coffee and molasses delighted said i if you'll get back in good time so i won't keep supper waiting at the farm i'll be back inside of an hour sure replied matt confidently knowing matt's fondness for a little gossip at the grocery i felt by no means so confident but i could not hesitate to oblige him in the matter a small enough return for the favors he was doing me daily i stayed in the water nearly half an hour and while i was swimming about i noticed that the wind was fast freshening the steep and broken waves made swimming somewhat difficult and the crests of the white caps that occasionally slapped me in the face made me gasp for breath while dressing i thought with some consternation that this vigorous wind would prove a serious hindrance to matt barnes's return as it would be blowing directly in his teeth for a time i sat sulkily in the door of the boom house with my feet on a block to keep them out of the wet the door opened away from the wind and against the back of the little structure the waves were beginning to lash out with sufficient violence to make me uneasy i strained my eyes up river to catch the first glimpse of matt forcing his way cleverly against the tossing whitecaps but no such welcome vision rewarded me at last i was compelled to acknowledge that the storm had become too violent for him to return against it without assistance i should have to wait in the boom house either till the wind abated or till matt should succeed in finding a pair of stout arms and a willing heart to come with him to my rescue at first my thoughts dwelt with keen regret on the smoking pancakes and luscious maple syrup that i knew were even then awaiting me at the farmhouse under the hill and somewhat bitterly i reviled matt's lack of consideration but as the sky grew rapidly dark while it wanted yet a half hour of sundown and the wind came shrieking more madly down from the hills and the boom house began to creak and groan and shudder beneath the waves that were leaping upon it anxiety for my safety took the place of all other considerations frail as the boom house appeared it was well jointed and framed or it would simply have gone to pieces under the various assaults of wind and waves and the rolling of the boom the floor in particular was very carefully secured being bolted to the boom at the four corners that it might not be torn away by any chance collision with log or ice cake at every wave however the water came spurting through the cracks of the wall and i was drenched almost before i knew it through the open door too the backwash of the waves rolled heavily and even without the increasing peril of the situation the prospect of having to pass the night in such cold inescapable slop was far from comforting the door was made to fit snugly so i shut it in the hope of keeping out some of the water but in the almost total darkness that ensued my apprehensions became unbearable the writhing roll of the boom grew more and more excessive and produced a sickening sensation i threw the door open again but was greeted with such a fierce rush of wave and spray that i shut it as quickly as i could 
i had never before been on the boom house after dark so i did not know what matt was accustomed to do for light after much difficult groping however i found a tin box fortunately quite waterproof in which were matches and a good long piece of candle when i had succeeded in getting the candle to burn i stuck a fork through it and pinned it to the driest spot i could find which was the edge of matt's bunk away up close to the roof presently a spurt of water struck the veering and smoking flame and again i was in darkness of course i lost no time in relighting the candle but within ten minutes it was out again i repeated the process and was prepared to keep it up as long as the matches would hold out in fact i was thankful for that little annoyance as it gave me something to do and diverted my mind somewhat from my own helplessness and from the eminent peril of the situation there was absolutely nothing that i could do to help myself to reach the shore by crawling along the boom would have been quite impossible i should have inevitably been swept off before going three feet beyond the shelter of the boom house in those choppy and formless seas and in the bewildering darkness i should have found it impossible to swim or even to keep my mind clear as to the direction in which the shore lay though a strong swimmer and accustomed to rough water i knew very well that in that chaos i should soon be exhausted and either drowned or dashed against the boom there was nothing to do but wait and pray that the boom house might hold together till calm or daylight it was a strange picture my faint candle revealed to me within the four narrow walls of my refuge all the implements and accessories of matt's somewhat primitive housekeeping had been shaken from their shelves or from the nails on which they hung and were coasting about the floor with a tinny clatter as the boom twisted and lurched from side to side three joints of rust-eaten stove-pipe kept them in countenance and from time to time i had to jump nimbly aside to save my shins from being broken by the careering little stove sometimes i would be thrown heavily against the wall or the door at last i climbed into the bunk where i crouched dripping and shivering both courage and hope pretty well drenched out of me being something of a slave to routine when i found myself in what resembled a sleeping place or might have resembled one under more favourable circumstances i took out my watch to wind it the hour was half-past nine from that hour till nearly midnight there was no change in the situation finding that the matches were running low i occupied myself in protecting the light with the aid of the tin box already spoken of and at last strange as it may seem i found myself growing sleepy it was partly the result of exhaustion caused by my anxiety and suspense but partly also no doubt a sort of semi-hypnotic bewilderment induced by the motion and by the monotonous clamour of the storm as i sat there crouching over the candle i must have dropped into a doze for suddenly i felt myself hurled out of the bunk i fell heavily upon the floor the boom house was in utter darkness i staggered to my feet and groped for the candle it was gone from the edge of the bunk in my fall i had evidently swept it away the motion of the boom had now greatly increased in violence and it was impossible for me to stand up without clinging tightly to the edge of the bunk in the thick dark the stove crashed against my legs so heavily that i thought for a moment one of them was broken i drew myself up again into the bunk no longer feeling at the least degree sleepy presently i realized what had happened the boom had parted at the joint where the wings began and my section was swinging before the wind the waves frequently went clear over the roof and came pouring down the vacant stove hole in torrents whose volume i could guess by their sound the pitching rolling tossing and the thrashing of the waves were appalling and i fervently blessed the sound workmanship that had put together the little boom house so as to stand such undreamed of assaults but i knew it could not stand them much longer moment by moment i expected to find myself fighting my last battle amid a crash of mad waters and shattered timbers in a little i began to realize that the boom must have parted in two places at least from the unchecked violence of its movements i knew it must have broken loose at the pier with this knowledge came a ray of hope 
as my section was now nothing more than a long and very attenuated raft it might presently be blown ashore somewhere if the boom house would only hold out so long i might have a fair chance of escaping but i realized that the progress of the fragment of boom would necessarily be slow as wind and current were at odds together over it cooped up in that horrible darkness and clinging on to the edge of the bunk desperately with both hands the strain soon became so intolerable that i began to wish the boom house would go to pieces and put me out of my misery none the less however did my heart leap into my throat when at length there came a massive thud a grinding crash and the side of the boom house opposite the bunk was stove in at the same time the marvellously tough little structure was twisted half off its foundations and bent over as if a giant hand had crushed it down i at once concluded that we had gone ashore on the point i tried to get the door open that i might have some chance of saving myself but the twisting of the frame had fastened it immovably madly i wrenched at it but that very stability of structure which had hitherto been my safety proved now my gravest menace i could not budge the door and meanwhile i was being thrown into all sorts of positions while the boom ground heavily against the obstacle with which it had come in contact the boom house was half full of water a fierce indignation now seized me at the thought of being drowned thus like a rat in a hole reaching down into the water my hands came in contact with the little stove i raised it aloft and brought it down with all my strength against the door the stove went to pieces bruising and cutting my hands but the door was shattered and a wave rushed in upon me holding my breath i was tearing at the remnant of the door in doubt as to whether i should get free in time to escape suffocation when the boom gave a mightier heave and the upper part of the boom house crashed against the obstacle with a violence that tore it clear of its base the next instant i was in deep water striking out blindly when i came up providentially i rose clear of the shattered boom house i could see nothing and i was almost choked but i kept my presence of mind and battled strenuously with the boiling seas which tossed me about like a chip in a second or two i was dashed against a pile of timbers half stunned i yet made good my hold and instantly drew myself higher up on the pile as soon as i had recovered my breath sufficiently to realize anything i perceived that i was on one of the piers the upper portion of the great structure was open and i speedily crawled down among the rocks with which these piers are always ballasted as i crouched to escape the chill wind which hissed between the logs how i gloried in the thought that here was something not to be tossed about by wind and wave drenched shivering exhausted as i was i nevertheless felt my bed of rocks in the pier top a most luxurious retreat i presently fell asleep and when i awoke the dawn was pink and amber in the eastern sky i saw that the pier which had given me refuge was that to which the sheer boom had been fastened the storm had moderated somewhat and forcing its way determinedly toward the pier came matt's skiff propelled by matt himself and jim coxon from the corners i declare said stranion i almost feel the tent and the floor itself rocking so vivid is the picture ranolf has given us well remarked magnus it can rock us all to sleep and the sooner the better in a very few minutes we were snugly rolled in our blankets then stranion rose on his elbow and blew out the candle doused the glim as he was wont to say in the thick dark we swiftly sank to sleep on the day after the rain there was a wonderful exhilaration in the air we felt like shouting and running races the face of earth wore a clean and honest look queerman roamed hither and thither declaiming miss guinea's fine lines up with the banners on the height set every matin bell astir the tree-top choirs carouse in light the dews on flocks and lavender till at last we pulled his hat down over his mouth and made him go fishing with us he declared he didn't want to fish that day so we took him to carry our captures this time we cut through the woods and struck the river about half a mile below the outlet the sparkling day had made us break bounds 
at this point the squatook river after rushing in white capped tumult down a gloomy channel broadens fan-like out and breaks over a low fall into a pool of quiet waters out of which roars a strong rapid the pool is wide and deep and girt with great rocks over the black surface fleecy masses of froth were wheeling how our hearts leaped at the sight behold us waist deep around the margin of the pool or braced upon the edge of the fall the surface is lashed sometimes in three or four places at once by the struggles of the speckled prey against the slow inexorable reel our excitement is intense but quiet its only expression is the reel's determined click or its thrilling swift rattle as the taut line cuts the water and the rod bends and bends a smallish fish has taken sam's drop and is being reeled half spent across the basin the leader trails out behind there is a shining swirl beside it a strike and stung by the check the very monarch of the pool flashes up and darts like lightning downstream but sam's fly is sticking in his jaw now gallant fisherman hold thine own we forget our own rods more than once sam's reel is almost empty for twenty minutes the result is doubtful then reluctantly victory declares herself for the lithe rod and the skilful wrist the larger of these two prizes which our lucky fisherman thus brought to land just tipped the beam at two and three-quarters pounds the other was a light half-pounder that day after a hasty lunch we bade farewell to camp de squatook the morning's fishing had been so good that we resolved to keep its memory unblurred a sudden desire seized us for fresh fields and pastures new we struck tent packed the canoes and paddled out joyously from the landing through the whitefish barrier we slipped smoothly and swiftly onward down the racing current almost before we could realize it we were in the wild sluice above the fall there was a clear channel at one side and we raced through the big ripples with a shout and a cheer but alas for high spirits and heedlessness sam and ranolf were in the rear canoe they objected to this position and just after running the chute and clearing the basin they tried to pass magnus and me we were in the strong and twisting current however and the first thing our rivals knew they were thrown upon a round-backed weedy rock their canoe turned over gracefully and discharged her whole burden into the stream instantly the surface of the pool was diversified with floating paddles poles tent pens tin kettles box covers etc and stranian and queerman magnus and i were busy capturing these estrays in this eddy below the canoe was got ashore righted and found to be none the worse our heavy valuables guns and the like were lashed to the canoe and hence got no worse than a wetting but our axe and various spoons and forks were gone from our sight for ever the oatmeal was a part of our lading and the tobacco as well for this last we felt no anxiety congratulating ourselves that it was in a waterproof tin we did not at the time open this tin as there was tobacco enough for a time in the other canoes but the meal bag was a slop henceforth we were to have no porridge only beans 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 to go with our trout and canned knick-knacks and this meant nothing more nor less than dinner three times a day instead of the old appetizing sequence of breakfast dinner and uh, dinner after a brief delay we continued our journey an exciting afternoon it proved throughout leaving us well tired at evening taking care to preserve a discreet distance between the canoes whenever the current grew threatening we slipped on swiftly between ever varying shores rounding a sharp turn we would see before us a long slope of angry water with huddling waves and frequent rocks and at the foot of the slope three or four great white ripples forming and roaring in the sun then a brief season of stern restraint strong checkings strenuous thrustings sudden bold dashes and hair's breadth evasions a plunge and a cheer and drenched from the crest of that last ripple we would look back on the raging incline behind us this sort of thing took place three times within two hours 
we passed without stopping through second lake and under the majestic front of sugarloaf mountain which is matchlessly reflected in the deep still waters the mountain towers from the water's edge its base in a cedar swamp its lofty conical summit which topples towards the lake as if it had received a mighty push from behind veiled and softened with thick bushes and shrubbery some time after sundown we reached the mouth of a tributary stream known as the horton branch this was a famous trout water and we determined to fish it thoroughly on the morrow by the time we had the tent pitched a few trout caught in the gathering dusk and a mighty dinner cooked and eaten our eyes were filled with sleep we cared not for stories that night but smoked brief pipes and then turned in in the morning after an early breakfast we pulled up to the big jam a distance of nearly six miles the big jam is a sort of dam formed of logs and tree trunks and a long accumulation of debris just beneath it lies one of the finest trout pools i have ever fished which is saying not a little the poling up horton branch was delightful a stiffish current but few rocks arrived at the pool we made a great haste to put our rods together so tempting were the eddies never surely shall i forget that morning's fishing all the flies in our books seemed equally killing those big jam trout were insatiable we soon grew hard to please and made it a rule to return at once to its native element every fish that did not approach three-quarters of a pound this had the proper effect of limiting our take to something near what we could at once consume a few fine fish we packed in salt in a sort of basket of birch bark which stranion ingeniously constructed toward noon the fish stopped rising then we lunched and took a long siesta in the afternoon the sport was brisk but not equal to that of the morning no doubt if we had stayed till sundown the morning's experience would have been amply repeated but we were not so greedy as to desire that we left in high spirits at about five o'clock and slipped merrily down to our camp on the main squatook end of chapter five chapter six of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the camp on squatook river part one that night around the campfire stories were once more in demand stranion was first called upon and he at once responded i'll call this story saved by a sliver and ask you to observe the neat alliteration said stranion in the autumn of eighteen eighty seven i was hunting in those wildernesses about the headwaters of that famous salmon river the southwest miramichi i had old jake christison with me the best woodsman on the river and i had also my inseparable companion and most faithful follower jeff a large bull terrier jeff was not a hunting dog in any accepted sense of the word he had no inherited instinct for the chase but he had remarkable intelligence unconquerable pluck unquestioning obedience and hence a certain fitness for any emergency that might arise in the woods he always crept noiselessly at my heels as unembarrassing and self-effacing as my shadow one morning we set out from camp soon after breakfast to follow up some fresh caribou signs which jake had just reported we had gone but half a mile into the thickets when the woodsman discovered that he had left his hunting knife by the campfire where he had been using it to slice the breakfast bacon to go without his hunting knife could not for a moment be thought of so he turned back hurriedly to get it while i strolled on at a leisurely pace with jeff at my heels my way led me through a little wide ravine in the centre of which lay the fragments of a giant pine shattered years ago by lightning and bleached by storm and sun a portion of the trunk remained yet upright a tall splinter or sliver as the woodsmen call it split from the rest of the trunk by some electric freak and pointing like a stern white finger toward the spot of open sky above whence the bolt had fallen saturated with rosins the sliver was practically incorruptible and time had only served to harden its lance-like point and edge a few feet beyond this blasted pine the woods grew thick 
a dusky confusion of great gnarled trunks and twisting limbs as i sauntered up to the foot of that whitened trunk jeff suddenly thrust himself in front of me with a low almost inaudible growl and stood obstinately still as if to bar my farther advance instantly my glance penetrated the thicket and fell upon a huge panther crouching flat along a fallen tree of almost the same color as the brute's hide it was the panther's cold green eyes indeed that so promptly revealed him to me he was in the attitude to spring and ordering jeff to heel i sank on one knee cocking my rifle and taking aim at the same time for there was not a moment to lose even as i pulled the trigger the animal dashed upon me in the very face of the flash the suddenness of the assault of course upset my aim but by good chance the ball went through the animal's fore shoulder breaking the bone i was hurled backward into a hollow under the fallen fragments of the pine tree and i felt the panther's teeth go through my left arm thrusting myself as far as possible beneath the shelter of the log i reached for the long knife at my belt just as i got it out of its sheath the panther with an angry cry dropped my arm and turned half round while keeping his place upon my prostrate body my faithful jeff had come to the rescue of his master and had sunk his terrible teeth into the root of the panther's tail the snarling beast doubled back upon himself and struggled to seize the dog between his jaws but jeff was too wary and active for this and the panther would not leave his post of vantage on my body he was a sagacious beast and perceived that if he could let me up he would have two enemies to contend with instead of one as for me in my restricted position i found myself unable to use my knife with any effect i lay still abiding my opportunity and watching with intense but curiously impersonal interest the good fight my bull terrier was making i was not conscious of much pain in my arm but the shock of the panther's assault seemed in some way to have weakened my vital force presently the panther finding it impossible to release himself from that deadly grip of jeff's threw himself over on his back curling himself up like a cat and raked the dog severely with his dangerous hind claws the change in our assailant's position released my right arm and at once i drove the knife into his side square to the hilt i failed to touch a vital spot but the wound diverted his attention and jeff bleeding and furious was enabled to secure a new hold the panther was a splendid beast and fought as i never before or since have seen a panther fight had it not been for my shot which broke his fore shoulder it would have gone hard with both jeff and me as it was however the panther found his work cut out for him though i was so nearly helpless from my position that jeff had to bear the brunt of the battle the brave terrier was getting badly cut up i could not see very well what went on being at the bottom of the fight and my breath nearly knocked out of me but all of a sudden a rifle shot rang in my ears the smoke and flame filled my eyes and the body of the panther stiffened out convulsively the next instant old jake was dragging me out from beneath and anxiously inquiring about my damages reassuring him as to my condition i sat down rather faintly on the trunk while jeff at my feet lay licking his scratches the old woodsman leaned upon his empty rifle contemplatively scanning our vanquished foe and loudly praising jeff suddenly he broke off in the midst of a sentence and glanced up into the branches ahead of him great jehoshaphat he exclaimed in a startled voice springing backward and snatching for a fresh cartridge while jeff jumped to his feet with a wrathful snarl in the same breath before i could realize what was the matter i heard the female panther made of him we had killed utter her fearful scream of rage and pain from a giant limb overhead her long tawny body flashed out into the sunlight descending upon our devoted party like a yellow thunderbolt weak and dazed as i was i shut my eyes with a sense of sick disgust and weariness and a strange feeling of infinite suspense 
there was a curious sound of tearing and scratching but no shock came and i opened my eyes in astonishment there was jake calmly slipping a cartridge into his rifle there was jeff standing just as i had seen him when i closed my eyes it seemed hours but it had been merely an eye wink the fraction of a second but where was the panther my inward query was answered on the instant a wild and indescribable screeching spitting and snarling arose mixed with a sound of claws tearing desperately at the hard wood of the pine trunk the panther was held aloft in the air impaled on the sliver around which she spun madly like a frightful wheel of tawny fire her efforts to free herself were tremendous but there was no escape the sliver was hard as steel and as inexorable suddenly jeff sprang at the creature but in his impetuosity missed his hold and got a lightning blow from one of those great claws almost laying his side open the brave dog carries the marks of that wound to this day his revenge was instantaneous for his next leap gained its object and his jaws fixed themselves securely in the panther's haunches the whole wild scene had thus far been like a dream to me and the yellings and snarlings sounded far off and indistinct the only reality seemed to me the still brown and green of the forest the moveless tree-tops the cheerful morning sun streaming down into the little glade and the old woodsman standing in his contemplative attitude watching the gyrating form of the panther then on a sudden my blood seemed to flow with a rush of new force and a sense of reality came back to me i jumped up slipped a cartridge into my rifle and with a timely bullet put the unhappy beast out of its pain in order to release the panther's body we had to cut down the sliver the blood-stained top of which with its point sharp and spear-like as if fashioned by the hand of man now hangs as a treasured relic upon my library wall right beneath as a foot-rug to my writing-table and a favourite napping-place for jeff is the panther skin with two holes in it where the sliver went through the other skin i gave to old jake as a memorial of the adventure but it is probable he sold it at the earliest fair opportunity for it was a comely and valuable skin stranion said i when he concluded your jeff is one of the dogs whom i am proud to have known i have only met in all my career one better dog and that was my brave old dan of blessed and many scarred memory bigger not better dog interrupted stranion sternly well we won't argue over it they were both of the same stock anyway and i fear we will not look upon their like again eh stranion now you're talkin o m responded stranion warmly but tell us that great yarn about dan's battle no not to-night was my answer it would seem like making rivals of dan and jeff which they never were but always sworn chums jeff is enough for one night dan shall be commemorated on another let sam give us a bear story now all right said sam here's one in which stranion and i were both concerned noted down by the name of skidded landing three winters ago as some of you will remember stranion and i took a month in the lumber woods it was drawing on towards spring as we were both good snowshoers we managed to visit several widely scattered camps at all we were received hospitably with unlimited pork and beans hot bread and tea and at each we made a stay of several days for our climax we selected that camp which promised us the most picturesque and exciting experiences at the breaking up of the ice this was evans camp on green river where the logs were gathered in what is known as a rough and tumble landing a form which entails much excitement and often grave peril to the axeman whose work is to cut the brow loose as it happened however the most stirring adventure that fell to our personal experience on that trip was one we encountered at clark's camp on the tobique where we stayed but three days this camp but one of the many centres of operation of the great lumbering firm of clark and company was generally known as skidded landing and here let me explain the terms brow drive rough and tumble landing and skidded landing 
in lumberman's parlance the logs of the winter's chopping hauled and piled on the river bank where they can conveniently be launched into the water upon the breaking up of the ice are termed collectively a brow of logs when once the logs have been put into the water and shepherded by the lumbermen with their pike poles are flocking wildly seaward on the swollen current they and their guardians together constitute the drive the task the lumbermen are now engaged upon is termed a stream driving and laborious perilous work it is especially on those rivers which are much obstructed by rapids rocks and shoals a brow of logs is a landing when the logs are piled from the water's edge a landing may be either a rough and tumble or a skidded landing the rough and tumble which good woodsmen generally regard as a shiftless affair is made by driving a few heavy timbers into the mud at the water's edge at the foot of a sloping bank these form a strong and lofty breastwork into the space behind are tumbled the logs helter-skelter from the top of the bank as they are hauled from the woods all through the winter the space keeps filling up and by spring the strain on the sustaining pile is sometimes tremendous when the thaw comes and the river rises the ice goes out with a rush then the accumulation of logs has to be set free this is done by cutting away the most important of the sustaining timbers whereupon the others snap and the logs go roaring out in a terrific avalanche it is easy to realize the perils of cutting out this kind of landing if the landing has been unskillfully or carelessly located the peril of the enterprise is greatly increased the skidded landing is a much more business-like affair in this kind of structure the logs are placed systematically first a layer of logs is deposited parallel with the river's edge across these at right angles are laid a few light poles technically termed skids on these another layer of logs parallel to the water and so on to the completion of the structure with this species of landing to release the logs is a very simple matter there is nothing to do but quietly roll them off layer by layer into the stream which snatches them and hurries them away from this it will be seen why we did not elect to stay long at skidded landing but while we were there something happened in this fashion on the second day of our stay in the camp it chanced that stranion was lazy when i set forth to examine some snares which i had set the night before he chose to snooze in his bunk rather than accompany me as events befell he proved to have made the wiser choice of course i took my gun with me i was thinking of small game exclusively during our wanderings hitherto we had seen nothing larger than a fox and both barrels were loaded with cartridges containing number four shot but with unaccountable thoughtlessness i neglected to take any heavier ammunition in my pocket yet that was the only time on the trip that heavier ammunition was needed i visited my snares and found in one of them a rabbit the boys'll appreciate a rabbit stew thought i as i hitched the frozen carcass to my belt a little farther on i started another rabbit which i shot and hitched beside its fellow and then i struck out blithely for camp before i had retraced my path many paces i came face to face with an immense bear which apparently had been dogging my steps we halted and eyed each other sharply i thought i detected a guilty uneasiness in the animal's gaze as if he were properly ashamed of himself for his ungentlemanly conduct presuming upon this i spoke in an authoritative voice and took one or two firm steps in advance i expected the animal to step aside deferentially and let me pass but i had forgotten that this was a hungry season for bears the brute lumbered forward with alacrity as if ferociously surprised at my readiness to furnish him a much-needed luncheon in my trepidation i did not let him get near enough before i fired my solitary cartridge had i let him come to close quarters the heavy birdshot would have served the full purpose of a bullet but no i was in too much of a hurry the charge had room to scatter before it reached my assailant and the pellets only served to cut him up badly about the head without in the least interfering with his fighting capacity with something between a grunt and a howl of pain and fury he dashed upon me and i dropping my cherished weapon in a panic made a mighty bound to one side and darted toward the open river 
i wanted free play for my snowshoes and no risk from hidden stumps in the woods the snow was soft enough to give me some advantage over my pursuer i gained on him when doing my utmost but being gaunt from his long fast and very light in proportion to his prodigious strength his progress with that awkward gallop of his was terrifyingly rapid moreover i had vividly before my mind's eye the consciousness of what would be my instant fate should i trip on a buried stump or root or plunge into some snow-veiled bush that would tangle my snowshoes once out upon the river i breathed more freely but the bear was hard upon my heels here the snow was more firmly packed and he travelled faster i ceased to increase the little distance between us after two piercing yells for help i saved my breath for the race before me i was really not very far from the camp but the trees and a high point intercepted my cries and the wind blew them away so they failed to reach stranion's ears nevertheless it happened that stranion grew restless about the time of my first meeting with the bear he strolled down to the landing which was perhaps three hundred yards from the camp seated himself upon a spruce log and began to dig off with his pocket knife the perfumed amber-like globules of gum he was engaged in this innocent if not engrossing occupation when he caught sight of me racing desperately around the jutting point immediately above the landing at the sight of my terror he sprang to his feet and was about to rush back to camp for his gun but straightway the bear appeared and so close behind me that he knew there was no time to get the weapon the emergency was upon him he knew something had to be done at once fortunately he was ready of resource he dropped down and crawled swiftly to the edge of the landing the track i was following led along close under the front of the landing then turned the corner sharply and ran straight up to the camp the bear was now gaining on me he was not more than thirty or forty feet behind i was beginning to realize that he must catch me before i could reach the camp coming to this conclusion i was about to put forth all my remaining breath in one despairing shriek for help then to turn and make what fight i could with my sheath knife which had already been used to cut away the dangling rabbits when out of the corner of my eye i caught sight of stranion on the top of the logs i took one look at his face and saw its look of readiness he grinned encouragingly but put his finger on his lips for silence at the sight of him i felt new vigor flow through all my veins with fresh speed i raced along past the front of the landing turned the corner and bounded up the slope reaching the hard track i kicked my feet clear of the snowshoes and started to climb up the logs to join stranion at this moment stranion found his opportunity the bear came plunging along on my tracks immediately beneath the face of the logs and now with a stake which he had snatched up stranion pried mightily upon the two front logs of the top tier the great timbers rolled swiftly over the edge one of them the heaviest was just in time it caught the animal over the hindquarters and crushed him to the ice when stranion's triumphant shout proclaimed the success of his attack i threw myself down between two logs and lay there gasping while stranion returned to the camp got his gun and put the wounded animal out of his pain later in the day much later stranion and i together went over the ground i had traversed with such celerity we recovered the rabbits and also after a persistent search in the snow the gun which i had so basely abandoned i think that is a pretty straight account of what happened said stranion and now we will hear something from magnus's uncle no said magnus i'll tell you something my cousin rob raven told me about a time he had with a mad stallion there is perhaps no beast said bob more terrible more awe-inspiring than a stallion that has gone mad such an animal bursting all the fetters of his inherited dread of man seems inspired with a frightful craving to take vengeance for the immemorial servitude of his kind as a rule he has no quarrel with anything but humanity often with other horses he associates amicably and toward the cattle and lesser animals that may be with him in the fields he displays the indifference of disdain but let man woman or child come within his vision 
and his homicidal mania breaks into flame i have had several disagreeable encounters with vicious horses but only once was i so unfortunate as to fall in with one possessed by this homicidal mania my escape was so narrow and the experience left so deep an impression upon my mind that i have felt ever since an instinctive distrust for this most noble of domestic animals one autumn when i was about eighteen i was taking a tramp through the eastern townships of quebec preparatory to resuming work at college i reached the little village of maybury one day at noon and dropped into the village inn for luncheon the village was in a state of excitement over a tragedy which had taken place that very morning and which was speedily detailed to me by every one with whom i came in contact the most authentic account as it appeared was that given me by the proprietor of the inn you see he answered eagerly in response to my question as to the cause of the general excitement a boy at old joe cook was a bringin up in his farm was just been killed by a mad horse the boy come out from liverpool last june two year ago with a lot more poor little beggars like him and old joe kinder took a fancy to him and was a bringin him up like he was his own son the horses is most runnin at pasture now in the back lots yonder an atkinson stallion which has always had the name of being kind as a lamb is pasturin with the rest but he seems somehow to have got mad all of a sudden this morning early as cook's boy was comin home from drivin the cows out on to the uplands he found the horses all crowdin round the gate leadin on to the meadows he knowed some of em might try and shove through if he didn't take keer so he just kind of shoot em off with a stick they all scattered away savin only atkinson stallion and he wheelin round with a kind of screech as ud make the marrer freeze in your bones grabbed the boy right by the back of the neck and shook him like old tige there shake a rat i guess the poor boy's neck was broken right off for he never cried out nor nothin steve barnes was just then a comin up the meadow road and he seen it all he yelled and run up as fast as he could but afore he could get to the fence the stallion had jumped on the boy two or three times and was a standin lookin at him curious like steve seen that a boy was dead but he started to climb over and drive off the brute but as soon as the stallion seen steve he let another screech and run at him with his mouth wide open and steve had nothin for it but to hop back quick over the fence seein as the boy was deader than a door nail steve didn't think it'd be common sense to risk his life just for the dead body but he stayed there a stone in the brood which was just smilin to get at him after about an hour the other horses came back and the stallion forgot about the boy and went off with them way back behind the hills and steve got the body and carried it home and what have they done to the brute i inquired with a fierce anger stirring in my veins well answered boniface this afternoon there's a crowd a going out to catch him and to tie him up if he's too bad for that and if i know anything about horses he's just gone mad stark mad why they'll have to shoot him off hand to save their own necks i wonder if i'll run any risk of meeting him i queried rather anxiously i had no weapon but my heavy walking stick and i had an almost sentimental regard for the integrity of my neck which way you'd be bound inquired boniface for blissville i answered oh said he you're all right then the horses are a feedin out yonder to the northeast and blissville lays south it was with few misgivings that i now resumed my journey in the tonic autumn air my spirits rose exultantly and i walked with a brisk step whistling and knocking off the golden tops of the hawk bit with my cane the country about maybury is a high rolling plateau for the most part open pasture ground with here and there a shallow wooded ravine and here and there a terrace of loose boulders with bramble thickets growing between i was soon beyond the cultivated fields past the last of the fences i had climbed one of those rocky terraces and made a couple of hundred yards across the delightful breezy down when behind a low knoll i caught sight of a group of horses quietly pasturing and remembered with a qualm the morning's tragedy could this i asked myself anxiously be the herd containing that mad stallion i halted and was about to retrace my steps unobtrusively in the hope that i had escaped their notice but it was too late two or three of the animals raised their heads and looked toward me 
one in the group snorted with a peculiar half whinny at the sound of which my heart sank then i caught sight of one in the centre that seemed to be jumping up in the air off all four feet at once the next moment this creature a great black animal appeared outside the group plunging and biting at his flank two or three times he sprang into the air in that strange spasmodic way i had already observed and threw his head backward over his right shoulder with an indescribable gesture of menace and defiance then with a short dreadful sound he darted toward me open-mouthed up to this point i had stood my ground eyeing the brute resolutely with an appearance of fearlessness which i was very far from feeling but now i saw that my only hope and that a desperate one lay in flight i was accounted at college a first-rate sprinter and now i ran my best the two hundred yards that lay between me and the terrace i had just left must have been covered in not much more than twenty seconds but as i reached the brow of the slope the mad brute was close on my heels i had no time to check myself and even less notion to do so in fact i fell and rolled headlong down dropping bruised and bewildered into a crevice between two boulders the next instant i saw the black mass of my pursuer dashing over me in a splendid leap before he could turn and seize me i had rolled farther into the crevice and found that one of the rocks overhung so as to form a little narrow cave into which i could squeeze myself so far as to be quite beyond the animal's reach never before or since have i discovered so unexpected and providential a refuge the raving stallion came bounding and leaping up to the very door of my burrow but i felt safe he would roll back his lips lay his ears flat to his head spring straight into the air and shriek through his wide red nostrils his fury and his challenge the latter i did not think it incumbent upon me to accept i waved it in disdainful silence for a time the brute kept up his boundings and those strange proud jerkings of his head but at length he actually tried to stretch his neck into my burrow and reach me with his frightful naked teeth this was a vain attempt but i resented it and picking up a stone which lay at hand i struck him a heavy blow on the nose this brought the blood from those cruel nostrils and made him even if possible more furious in his rage but he returned to his former demonstrations it must have been for nearly an hour that i watched the mad creature's antics from my den the rest of the herd had approached and were feeding indifferently about the foot of the terrace from time to time my enemy would join them and snatch a few restless mouthfuls of grass but almost immediately he would return to his post at my door and his vigilant watch was on me all the time i was beginning to cast about somewhat anxiously for a way of escape from this imprisonment when i saw the pasturing herd suddenly toss up their heads and then go scurrying away across the down my adversary saw this too and turned his attention away from me i peered forth cautiously and to my profound relief i observed a party of men several carrying ropes and halters and others armed with rifles approaching below the terrace one man walked a little ahead of the others and held out a peck measure in which he shook something which i presumed to have been oats the stallion eyed them somberly for an instant and then his mane rose like a crest and his head went back with a shrill cry in the selfsame way as he had greeted my appearance he bounced into the air once or thrice and then he dashed upon the party the man with the oats fell back with wonderful alacrity and the fellows who carried halters seemed bent upon effacing themselves in the humblest manner possible one tall gray-shirted woodsman however stepped to the front raised his rifle and drew a bead upon the approaching fury while two or three of the others held their shots in reserve there was a moment of breathless suspense then the fine thin note of the woodsman's rifle rang out and the stallion sprang aside with a shriek and stumbled forward upon his knees almost instantly however he recovered himself and rushed upon his opponents with undiminished ferocity i held my breath he was almost upon the party now then two more rifles flashed from the sparksmen standing moveless in their tracks and the mad brute rose straight up on his hind legs and fell over backward 
dead i stepped out to welcome my rescuers and detailed to them my adventures they had been wondering who or what it was that the brute was laying siege to there was so much in fact to talk about and i found myself for the moment so important a figure that i returned to maybury for that evening and there had to retell my story at least a score of times if it's my turn now and i suppose it is said ranolf i can't pretend to give you anything so blood-curdling as this story of magnus's but i'll do my little best to make an angry bull moose as interesting as a mad stallion take this down o m as an adventure with a bull moose End of chapter six part one